especially pleased to welcome back to Georgetown, Alice McDermott, whose six celebrated novels have challenged and shape our, shaped our understanding of contemporary Catholic literature, as well as welcoming author and member of our university community, Paul Eli. Both of these authors have invited us through their prose to examine the dynamic interactions between faith, culture, and literary art. Their ability to spark our own deeply personal reflections on faith and the ways in which human beliefs become stitched into the fabric of daily life allows us to take pause to discover new meanings, new truths. There are few contemporary novelists more capable than Alice McDermott to lead us on this journey. Winner of the National Book Award in 1998 for her novel Charming Billy, her writing has been compared to literary greats such as James Joyce and William Faulkner. As journalist Charles Riley very appropriately summarized, her riveting plots, intricate use of point of view, and vivid recreation of Irish American communities of the mid 20th century have made her one of the most admired fiction writers of our time. It is through the act of vivid recreation that Alice's poignant understanding of the interconnectedness between faith and culture takes hold. To her Irish Catholic characters, faith is a way of life, an intuitive layer of being, a way of, of ordering the world that rarely requires reflection, but simply exists. As she described in an article for Boston College Magazine, quote, their faith is genetic, cultural, blood-borne, and as such, it is cause for neither fanaticism nor zealotry, crisis nor grief. With the religious lives of my characters firmly established, I can try to understand what lies beneath. In exploring this deeper level of what lies beneath, Alice presses us to understand belief as a profound expression of human instinct. It's a hope, a brave aspiration to affirm the existence of the seemingly impossible. Whether this means sustaining feelings of love and compassion for a lifelong alcoholic, as in Charming Billy, shunning the possibility of death, as Teresa does in Child of My Heart, or maintaining the powerful conviction that there will be life after we pass, as so ma many Catholics do throughout the world. And so we, we engage Alice's literary world feeling hopeful that there is something more, something greater to compel us forward and yet deeply humbled by the common human challenge of finding and defining our faith. It is within this context that Alice and Paul will converse today. And I can think of no two better authors to delve into these rich and powerful interactions between culture and faith. Born in Brooklyn, New York to an Irish American family, Alice attended Catholic school for all 12 years of her elementary education. She re received her BA from the State University of New York at Oswego and her MA in writing from the University of New Hampshire. Her six novels and numerous short stories have been received with great critical acclaim, beginning with A Bigamist Daughter in 1982 and finalists for the Pulitzer Prize that night in 1987 and after this in 2006. Her seventh novel, Someone, will be published in September. She's currently serving as writer in residence at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And the perfect partner to Alice McDermott in our literary conversation this afternoon, someone who also has devoted himself to themes of faith and literature, is Paul Eli. Paul inaugurated this series on faith and culture five years ago when he gave a lecture on Catholic culture in a critical age. Over this time, we've been privileged to welcome the campus leading writers, Ron Hansen, Marilyn Robinson, Richard Rodriguez, James Wood, in conversation with Paul. With us, Paul has discussed his own critically acclaimed book, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, an exploration of four intersecting biographies of influential U.S. Catholic literary figures of the 20th century, Dorothy Day, Thomas Merton, Flannery O'Connor, and Walker Percy. The Boston Globe called it, quote, an ode to faith and the art of the book as a tool of that faith. Paul's books, Paul's books seemed, seems the natural outcome for someone who examines ideas of faith and art. He received his BA from Fordham University, 
where he studied theology and philosophy, English and art. After receiving his MFA from Columbia, he became an editor at Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Paul's most recent book, published just this past year, Reinventing Bach, looks with, in the words of, the New York, of a New York Times review, quote, absorbing detail into how Johann Sebastian Bach interacted with the musical technology of his time and to the way his music is interpreted through our technology today. The result is a new account of Bach's life and new ideas about the transcendence of Bach's compositional and technological creativity. Paul currently serves as a senior fellow here at Georgetown at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs and is director of our American Pilgrimage Project, which is a Georgetown University partnership with StoryCorps. Paul's work with the Berkeley Center and his role moderating our university's ongoing faith and culture series explores religious beliefs and narratives, providing a place to record, examine, and understand the place of belief in contemporary society. Alice's and Paul's works both speak to the intersections between faith and culture, to the enduring questions that are addressed by art and literature, and perhaps most important, to the power of both faith and books. It's now my privilege to introduce to you the participants in today's conversation, Alice McDermott and Paul Eli. Thank you very much, President DeJoya, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and especially to be in conversation with Alice McDermott, uh, an author with whom I feel I've been in a uh, imagined or semi-imagined conversation for more than 10 years. I worked uh, for her publisher, Farah Strauss and Giroux, for years and years, and one of the privileges of the publishing job was that you would get to have, to be the first reader of uh, <coughs> important authors' new books when they came in. You would uh, have it printed out and it, you'd drop into your mailbox and you'd take it home for the weekend and, and read it uh, fresh before anybody else had been able to tell you what it was about or whether it was any good. And that, I called in a favor at FSG over the weekend and got Alice's new novel sent to me. So I'm uh, happy to declare that... Uh, <laughs> I, I did ask you that if I could read this, isn't that right? <laughs> you know, it occurred to me before, before I turned the first page that I'd better uh, check, check it out it's with you. It's very nice so. of you to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but I might have gone ahead and read it anyway. <laughs> you know, once you've got it in your hot little hands, <laughs> how, can you, how can you stop? So I read it over the weekend, and it's extraordinary. The novel's called Someone, and it's about... Uh, the interlocking lives of a number of Irish American characters in Brooklyn over large parts of the last century. And 231 pages in manuscript, you feel that whole lives are uh, telescoped into this story. And, but all the important uh, stuff, a lot of unimportant things, you have the gift of leaving out so that uh, I feel that I've been taken into parts of Brooklyn that I have never visited through the book, and yet, uh, was able to do this in just uh, 72 hours to you know, move through the century with you. I was really knocked out by the book. And in publishing, you feel almost obligated to say, well, it's the author's best book yet. But now I'm out of publishing, so free of any obligation, I'm able to say, yeah, it's your best book yet. Uh, thanks for letting me read it uh, early on. When your first few books came out, people would comment on their concision. They were under 250 pages. But now you've got something like 2,000 pages of published work. Uh, this is your seventh novel. When you set out, did you envision being the author of seven novels? Uh, is, was this all by design? or Tell me how that's come about. Thank you. Well, first, thank you, Dr. DeJoy, and thank you uh, all for being here. Um, uh, you know, I've been sort of thinking about this since Philip Roth announced his retirement. Um, I was very surprised to learn that you got to retire from being a fiction writer. I didn't know that was an option available to any of us. Um, but, it, but it made me think, um, how can you retire from a profession you never consciously joined? Um, it, I think most of us who, who write or, or feel the need to write or the impulse to write fiction uh, do so without anybody inviting us in. 
um, very few young writers have someone waiting breathlessly at the door of their their uh, office or studio or bedroom saying, uh, have you finished that story yet? I can't wait to read it. Um, so I, I guess I never um, anticipated what the breadth of my work would be uh, when I reached the ripe old age that I'm at now, um, but more that uh, there was a lot of work to do if you were going to pursue this um, itch to reorganize and retell and make sense of the wor world through language and story. Um, so I never, I mean, it, it's interesting. I never thought, gee, I, how, I wonder how many novels um, I have to write before I can retire. Um, just that there are lots of stories to tell, and I hope I have enough time to tell them. Um, What's amazing to me is not so much that now I can say I've written seven novels, um, it's that anybody reads them. <laughs> That's the part I hadn't counted on. <laughs> the uh, expression that we took as the title of this uh, event, Walking on Air, comes from a remark of Seamus Heaney's. He said uh, about the creative artist, we must learn to walk on air against our better judgment, and meaning that the, the confidence of the faring forward of the artist is a willingness to work in the dark and work intuitively without a knowledge of the outcome. Now, af after seven books, you have some uh, familiarity with the process and some command of the particulars. How do, you, how do you find yourself, how do you get to that place where you are going to walk on air again and where you can work intuitively and in the dark? How does that happen? Um, you know, again, I think... Um the, the wonderful thing, and maybe this is self-delusion, but the wonderful thing about this pursuit of story and, and reorganizing the world in language um, uh, is that uh, you're constantly a novice. Um, every story is a new story to tell, and you need to discover a new way to tell it. Um, and uh, you don't really know any more uh, about how to tell the story at hand because you've told another story. Um, that had different demands and different characters. Um, so I'm always, uh, I always feel I don't know what I'm doing um, and, and I have not really gained um, any expertise because I've told another story in another way, in another time and place. Every story makes me feel that I'm just setting out. Um, so there's always that sense of um, uh, I'm walking on, I'm stepping off the, the edge here. Um, the thing that, that's added to it once you have gotten a kind of reputation in the world um, is, is not only the challenge to resist all other voices, including um, your own, <laughs> about what you should or should not write. In other words, certainly there are many times in the composition of someone that I was saying, oh my God, Irish Catholics in New York again. I'm doing it again. <laughs> you know? um, but that, that's, that's irrelevant to the, the task at hand, which is to tell a particular character's story. That, that she so happens to be an Irish Catholic New Yorker and that I happen to have written about them before uh, is meaningless. That's just, that's, that's all part of all the stuff you have to lock outside uh, when you approach a new story. Um, this is her story. She doesn't know that I've written about these people. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's not wrong. She, she's got a voice that, that I'm just trying to authentically capture. Um, and so it comes down to that realization um, and, the, and the continual effort to remind yourself of that realization of, oh, wait a minute, this isn't about me. This book isn't about me. It's not about my career. It's not about what I've done before. You put yourself as the author completely to the service of the characters and their authentic experience. And everything else you've done in your life, um, how many kids you have and how many other books you've written and what the critics are going to say is all part of the stuff that, that stays outside. My obligation is to um, the character as she comes to life through language for me. It's such a surprising answer. There's a, an image in one of your novels of a 
college age young woman going upstairs to read Faulkner. And you've mentioned Faulkner, and Faulkner is the best example of the novelist who works in a, in a heightened past, writing about a particular place which is entered from all sorts of different directions. And in a way, that description applies to your work, but what you just said so strongly rejects that conception of it as a place where you're trying to fill in different, uh, put pieces of the puzzle into a larger whole. What I hear from what you just said is how strongly each work is conceived individually and almost in defiance of the fact that the others exist. Is that right? In some ways, in some ways. And, and again, but except that to say I'm, I'm writing this in defiance ad, admits to I'm being influenced by what I've already done. So even more so, um, I can't think about what I've already done. I, this, this character, this story, this situation, has not been told before, and I have to find the best way to tell it so that it will be true. Um, and anything, anything other than that that influences the decisions that I make as the author, um, it will make whatever I produce inauthentic um, because it's not arising out of, not so much arising just out of situation or plot or character, but arising out of what I like to think of is, is the incantation of the writing itself. Use, working at language, using language, working at even just the rhythm of the sentences, um, uh, and what is revealed to me about the subject through that hard work of getting the sentences right. Um, so it's, it's not even that you conceive of a story, you conceive of a character, and then put blinders on to the rest of the world. Um, but you hear a voice and you work at language. And this is the, the thrill of the pursuit that the by working at the language, um, you make discoveries you would not have made, could not have made otherwise about the character, about the story, about what it is to be human. And is that language, I mean, obviously you're discovering things through the language as you work, but how much is that language that you've carried over from your experience of that era growing up? When I read your work, I shudder to think at what my kids are gonna remember <laughs> because uh, I'm in the presence of an imagination that seems to have a perfect visual memory for a certain era, and then this auditory memory that enables you to write uh, 2013 English that uh, that so powerfully uh, puts us in another place in time without being historical fiction. Is that, uh, did you stockpile all those expressions <laughs> when you were an eight year old or <laughs> they just keep emerging, they're, they're somehow, was it genetically within you and, and they just come forth? I, I have two um, older brothers who are mostly intolerant of anything I have to say or, or anything that I do as older brothers are and um, when my third novel was published uh, at Weddings and Wakes, uh, he called me and said, because this was the first sort of Irish American, uh, New York, really New York novel. Um, and he called me and said, if I had known you were paying that much attention when you were a kid, I would have put a bag over your head. <laughs> 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 Brothers. <laughs> But you know, I think a lot of that, I mean, yes, the language, and especially with this latest book, um, the language of the era and of the characters was important to me. I mean, and, you know, on one level, uh, and it, it probably sounds very superstitious, super, uh, superficial, but um, I was gonna say superstitious, which is probably also true. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to write this story um, was because I love the phrase, parlor, floor, and basement. I love that phrase, parlor, floor, and basement. Um, and I had heard um, my mother and her generation use it in their context. And, and then now that Brooklyn is, um, is popular again, I've heard my children's uh, in a very different way using that. But there was just something lovely about the phrase. Just, I love the sound of it. There's, some, you know, it's, there's something old fashioned. Um, and some, the refinement of parlor floor and the, um, and the real life basement. <laughs> you know? And 
somehow out of that language, and I managed to get it right onto the first page, um, and it wasn't the whole reason why I was telling the story, believe me, but, but some, there is, again, something about the incantatory powers, incantatory powers of language that parlor floor and basement made me think about not only the refinement and the, the hardcore and the place where things are stored and the, and the place in the house that's meant for company, um, propriety, uh, uh, and, and also um, something about uh, negotiating between the two places, um, which involves a staircase, which involves being sure-footed or not. And so falling um, and, and um, seeing became a metaphor throughout the book. And it sort of all arose out of just, that's a delightful phrase. I'd like to make use of that. And it's amazing what you do do with it. It goes beyond what you've just explained. The, uh, in one of your earlier novels, in Charming Billy, the, uh, one of the characters, for her, the epitome of uh, um, prosperous middle-class existence is that she can open her ironing board in the basement and never have to close it again. <laughs> that, that space isn't a, a multi-use space. <laughs> then uh, we get to the new book, and the epitome of a middle-class prosperity for your protagonist, Marie, is uh, found in the funeral parlor, uh, where people are well-dressed, and there's a parlor uh, where the the, the wakes are held, and then there's this basement that she never has to go down to, and then there's an upstairs where the uh, stories are swapped about the freshly dead, and you've got uh, Brooklyn Irish Society uh, tiered like a wedding cake there, <laughs> uh, and I hadn't guessed that it came out of the parlor floor and basement that appears early in the book, but uh, that's, that's the way you work, is it not? That you make these connections on the level of language that don't really need to be spelled out to, to do their thing. Well, one hopes that they don't. <laughs> they sometimes, you know, um, I realize there are things that maybe I should have spelled out a little bit more clearly. But, but I think the point is that the language itself um, is, is, is what provides story rather than the other way around, um, which I think a lot of us, especially young writers start, okay, I've got this, well, this is why people at cocktail parties always come up to you and say, oh, you're a novelist? I have a great idea for a novel. <laughs> I'll tell it to you and Let you can just write it down. <laughs> right? You just write it, you do the easy part. I got the idea, you just write it down. We'll split the difference, you know. Uh, <laughs> but but so, so rather than having the story and, and, and fitting the words to it, as, as I think more of the journalist would do, this happened and now how do I best describe it and what do I lead with, it's, it's more, um, out of the language itself um, comes the discovery of character and story. And, and that rather than imposing an overriding metaphor such as that, um, but just, just examining um, the beautiful, the, the, it's, 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 it, there's a poetry to it. What makes that beautiful? And, and what does it say about the people who speak that term? Um, and, and then story um, is kind of evoked through, through a nice rhythmic sentence. Do you think that, how true is that? Uh, I think it's true among novelists, but some uh, commentators have tried to connect that to, to find a theological aesthetic in that, to say that uh, the religions of the book value the word in this way, that the word is a place of discovery, and so forth. I find there's something to it, but a lot of the uh, people who come up saying, I've got a great story, you could make a novel, they're also Irish Catholics, so <laughs> that would seem to disprove the idea that uh, this kind of respect for language as in incarnating something uh, doesn't come from our tradition. I mean, do you have any feelings on that? that? Is it just a novelist's thing, or does it come from the regard shown for language in the religion of your childhood, or somewhere else? or? Oh, I think it's, it, it has to be, I mean, and not to spend too much time on autobiography, but I, but I think, I think um, the language of the church, uh, the language of prayer and ritual, um, 
number one, I think it's the thing that stays with us, those of us who are cradle cat Catholics, no matter what we end up thinking about the church or how much time we end up spending there. Um, but the, the, the rhythm, the ritual, uh, the repeated phrase, um, and I think, and maybe this is where the, the Irish part of the Irish Catholicism comes in, but also that sense of, of course these words don't say it all. Of course these words don't pin it down. Um, that that uh, it's, a, it's prayer, it, the repetition of it, it's, it's not everything. It brings us to that point where language fails. Um, and the mystery is in the silence at the, end of the la at the end of the story, which is a wonderful phrase that Isaac Dinesen uses. Um, if, you've been true, if the storyteller has been true to the story, then the silence speaks and is more eloquent than the words could ever have been. And I think the tradition of prayer um, uh, and, and the realization very early, and I guess this is something that, that always annoys me about my apostate Catholic friends, um, I think growing up in the Catholic Church, especially after, after the Vatican, um, there, we, it was always pretty clear to us that, well, not literally, <laughs> you know, not literally, you know, I mean, you know, did, you know, came down from heaven. Well, I mean, not, you know, sure, clouds and all that, but not literally. Um, that, that language points us to something that we intuit as true, but can't define it. Um, so that's where the distrust of language, that, I, say that's, I think of that as particularly Irish, um, the love of language, but also the distrust for it. So you talk around um, and, and you repeat and, and you borrow prayers and poems and other people's words. Um, and again, a kind of incantation, but it brings you to a point where you understand there's more to it than can ever be said. And then in your novels, it seems to move beyond the spoken language of the church, let's say, to things in the tradition that among your characters are commonly understood, and you've talked about them as a language. So for example, there's some question in the new book of what it means to have a vocation, and whether a vocation uh, can be lost, and in what sense that vocation or calling persists even if the person is turned away from it. In an earlier book, Charming Billy, I'm not sure, but I'm eager to ask you, to what extent is the notion of uh, what it means to be a saint in play? I remember I was corresponding with a lot of writers, asking them to contribute essays to a book I was putting together of essays about saints. And I asked you, and you wrote back something like, uh, months later, I couldn't accept your invitation, but I wound up thinking about uh, saints and something else I was writing. And then your novel came in, and I wondered if that was the book or was it something else. Is that, uh, did, were you animated by the thinking about what a saint is when you were writing one of your novels? Yes, and it was, I th it was Charming Billy at the time. Um, and um, I don't know if I've told you this, but I did take a stab <laughs> at writing an essay. Quite um, a stab, it won the National Book <laughs> Award. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean a real essay. Oh, not just, <laughs> like a, a, not real just a novel. Thing, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, what those, those multi-talented writers can do. Right? Um, but, I, and I guess this is, this is what makes me forever a fiction writer and, and, and very, very, very seldom anything else. Um, uh, in an attempt to write about a so-called real life situation um, that evoked uh, the influence of a particular saint, um, I, I felt, um, as, I, as I tried to draft the essay, that this was not something that I was free to write about. Um, it was someone else's experience, um, and uh, it was a deeply felt experience that someone else had had that I understood, but it was the real world, and it was a real person. Um, and, um, and, I, and I had to back away from it because I, I felt I was intruding. Um, I felt there were things I understood about how the person felt, um, but it was that person's experience. Um, and it was an intrusion. And, it, and, and in some ways, it was, um, it was one of those instances um, where uh, 
the inner life, my inner life and the inner life of this person um, had to trump um, sharing it. But then you then took a pause and it wound its way back into the fiction? Or? Yes, but, it, but, but, yeah, but, but that whole sense of um, uh, you know, how, how, we, um, how we stand in relation to um, not only uh, our Catholic upbringing and stories of the saints that we may pull uh, back into our lives at various points in our lives, um, but, but just that sense of um, how we, standing on the outside, um, can observe and, and perhaps uh, gain something from the unspoken interior life of another character. And, and that was the aspect of, of sainthood um, that, that I felt I could, I could think about in fiction in, in a character who um, was not a betrayal of a real person, um, but a character of my own design. It's interesting because reading the book, it has to do uh, with a, a character who's uh, recently died and the funeral has been held and there's a luncheon and then uh, the characters get together to talk about this uh, dead man. And the let's say the literalist in me wishes, well, why didn't you ask these things while he was alive? You could have gotten some real answers. <laughs> but uh, what you're suggesting is that the combination of uh, curiosity and respect and even reverence for the interiority of another person is, uh, is what animated you to write the book. And if so, that's really uh, felt in the book. We can feel ourselves, we can watch the characters walk up to the edge of knowing another person, but also recognizing that uh, there's a limit to that knowledge and uh, there's past that is conjecture and let's say faith exactly. to know how this life turned out. Right, right. And, in, and for me, that's, that's, that's where the realm of fiction can get us places that, that um, other forms cannot. Um, to acknowledge, um, Carefully, um, but but um, with some idea of the the complexity of of the life, um, to acknowledge, we'll never know. We can't know. Um, to say that outside of fiction is like, well, yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, but to say it within the construct of of a made up story, um, I, I guess what I hope for that gets to that that reverberation of the silence um, at the end of the story. So I, I felt, reading the book and rereading it, well, I've known characters like Charming Billy, but I haven't really known them. I know Charming Billy Lynch better than I know his real-life counterparts because I've seen him from three or four points of view. I've had access to his interior life. In that sense, fiction, there's a, a knowledge of, uh, of the neighbor or the other that fiction uh, makes possible that uh, no other... Uh, let's say prose form uh, can easily do. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, um, there is a moment in the new book, um, there's also, a, in some ways, a Billy-like character, although he doesn't have any problem with the drink, um, in someone, in, in Gabe, the uh, narrator's brother. Um, and it wasn't until very late in the novel I was able to get a little girl finally to ask that question <laughs> that nobody else had just asked him. Um, you know, so how come you're not a priest anymore? Um, and, and for 220 pages, nobody was asking him. <laughs> you, know? I, you know, there was uh, just something we don't talk about. He came back, he left his first parish, he came home to, you know, he's just here, you know. Um, but I was able to get someone from the, um, the, the more inquisitive and, um, and uh, less subtle <laughs> generation, which is my own, um, to finally just ask him. I was greatly relieved that there was a character who could do that. <laughs> and now I wonder if we're, the next generation will ask, well, what does it matter wh why he's not a priest anymore? <laughs> There's a scene in, uh, at Weddings and Wakes, the characters uh, live in Long Island and they go to visit their aunt in Queens regularly and they uh, are greeted by her and she smells like a nun. 
in, in fact, he was, she was a nun. And I'm reading this thinking, you know, at what point will it be uh, impossible for uh, American Catholics to say she smells like a nun? <laughs> <laughs> and have we already reached that point of no return? And what will it mean for the writers of uh, fiction that deals with these things? I mean, do you think about that at all? Uh, how these stories are going to be thrown forward to, uh, to readers who won't have this uh, uh, immersive experience? Well, I am learning. Um, now that I've been in this long enough, over the long run, um, that I've been writing historical fiction all my life and just never realized it, you know. There, um, I've had a number of, I have brought up a number of times um, in, in Child of My Heart, um, there's a 15-year-old narrator looking back on her life and she's looking back in its early 60s. And a number of places she describes a, 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 a small child, a toddler, being left out alone on the front porch of a house and, um, and being tied into the back seat of a car with scarves. Um, uh, and this 15-year-old narrator um, ends up sleeping with a very old man. Uh, contemporary teenagers reading this book have no problem with her sleeping with this old man, but they can't understand, they can't believe anybody would leave a child alone out in a stroller. And, and I have heard from teachers time and time again, they're very upset about that. And, and they put Hawaiian punch in her bottle. What kind of people would put Hawaiian, and leave a baby alone? She's 15, he's 80? No, that's okay, I believe that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to say things, well, things were different in those days. <laughs> and is that, is that part of the motive uh, for the fiction, is, and entering into the record of the way, uh, way life was lived, or? Uh, as you've had to reflect on it, on experiences like that, do you, is that now part of your calculus as you sit down to show how things were? Um, again, no, I, I don't think it works as motive, but I, but I do think it is um, one of the things fiction does for us. Um, uh, you know, Nabokov talks about um, using detail in fiction um, is a way of stepping on time's receding tail. <laughs> You know, just and and it's and the sharper the detail and the more precise it is, um, the more you've preserved that that moment and that second. Um, so I think again, not as a motive, not as um, a putting under glass um, the the details of our lives as a you know as you would do in a museum, but making sure that they are again authentic and enough and 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 clearly imagined and clearly seen by the reader enough. Um, so that they, in some way, do preserve something um, that otherwise might be lost. In your Commonweal lecture, this was a piece from about 12 years ago. I attended the uh, event where you gave the lecture. I was up in the uh, peanut gallery. And let's just say there were a number of 80-year-old priests who were not uh, happy that the 70th uh, anniversary lecture for Commonweal Magazine was being delivered by you and that you were the authority, a laywoman, telling us all uh, what, what was what. And they made their feelings known, I think, during the question and answer period. But it's an extraordinary uh, essay, uh, Confessions of a Reluctant Catholic. And your reluctance is so well stated and earned that uh, you do come to seem this uh, best voice for the generation and, and crew that gathered around that magazine. And one of the things that you, uh, suggest in the piece uh, is that Catholicism is a shared language for your characters and one you had to find your way back to. But you also suggest that uh, your parents were the type who were w willing to uh, leave aside all the petty arguments that uh, emerged once the Second Vatican Council changed a lot of the manners in Catholicism. And you suggested that in some ways this is what you have tried to do as a novelist to not get ensnared in those uh, dis uh, discussions and not to uh, infect your fiction with them. And so your fiction is very stylized. It's, the Catholic world is very present in it, but there's not so much of the mechanics of how people go to church or uh, a spelling out of what particular doctrines they believe or how they came to believe them. And uh, as time goes on, this seems like a master stroke of yours. I'm reading Pow J.F. Powers' letters now, and he was concerned with that work, workings of the church, and it, it dates his work for me. So how, uh, 
can you tell me a little bit about how deliberate that was? And also, I mean, the way you put it in the essay, this is almost an act of faith to say, I'm not going to be bothered with that stuff. I'm going to focus on what's essential. How do you figure out what's essential and, and what, what, what goes in and what stays out? Well, again, I think, um, you know, it comes down to uh, pay, paying due respect to your own characters, number one, um, and, and not to write out of type or to even to write out of certain assumptions um, about any generation or any particular person in a historical time or place. Um, I remember I, um, uh, I, I wrote a, a little, little piece for my friend Dan Barry, who's a columnist, the about New York columnist, now he's about the whole world, <laughs> columnist in the New York Times, um, and uh, another New Yorker, Irish Catholic type. Um, and I, I remember saying to Dan, the thing that I, I loved about his essays, and he's a journalist, um, is that uh, there's a kind of unspoken refrain in, in all of his essays. Um, and what it is was, yeah, but what about this guy? You know, okay, yeah, this is what's happening, and this is, this is how we're summarizing the state of affairs in this world, in this town. Um, but Dan would always say, yeah, 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 okay, that's fine, that's fine, right, that's right, that's right. But, but look at this guy. What about this guy? Is that really what he thinks? What about his experience? And, and I think in some ways I try to do that as a fiction writer. Um, you know, certainly to understand the historical context and the culture and all that. But as we all do, none of us says, I, I am of my time and nothing else, or um, I am a collection of my experiences. It's, it's that, yeah, but I'm different, <laughs> you know? Um, and, and so to give the characters that, that kind of attention um, and, and to understand who they are um, and, and what makes them who they are, um, either in concert with the, their entire generation or in spite of it, um, but, but that to individualize them so much. In some ways, it's um, just as you want to make the, the specific detail of the time and place precise enough um, that it will seem a shock and a surprise <laughs> to the people who haven't lived in it. Um, I think you want, you want to give that same kind of attention to the characters. Um, so again, it can't come as a plan. Um, when I was trying to devise uh, Billy, um, and, and, and my impulse beginning that novel was just, I had written at Weddings and Wakes, I had done my Queens, Brooklyn, New York, Irish Catholic thing. I'm done with it. I'm not terribly interested in Irish Catholics. Um, uh, I did that. I took care of that. Fine. Um, and I went off and was writing another novel entirely. And then I started thinking, ah, yeah, but you know, there's that stereotype in that society. There's the lovable drunk. And, and the lovable drunk didn't appear in At Weddings and Wakes. But he would have in that world. Um, and so, of course, your first, first impulse is, number one, you should never write about such an ethnic stereotype, a lovable drunk who's, um, who's already dead from drinking himself to death, and you're going to open it at a wake. Are you kidding? <laughs> you know? um, so OK, you shouldn't write about a stereotype. But what if you did? How do you get, how do you get at? Because that, that person exists. There is such a, a character. And, and he exists in, in, that, in that culture, in that world. Um, a lot in many different forms. Um, so, so then you think, well, of course, the thing is to explode the stereotype. Oh, everybody loves Billy. He's a wonderful guy. He's always saying, you know, he's got the nicest thing. But, you know, he's a pedophile. He's a closet this or a closet that. You know, blow the stereotype apart. That would be the easy thing. Yeah, but that's a kind of cliche, too. How do you write about a character who, to his bones, is as the world per perceives him. Um, and then, then it's, oh my gosh, he's a real guy. And, and what makes him a real guy? The people who love him. Because they, they recognize, yes, another alcoholic in the family, another alcoholic in the neighborhood, um, another alcoholic uncle, cousin. Um, but you know what? Billy's different. You know, he's different. He's, we know him. Um, and, and 
And so if I can then get through the people who love him, who he is as an irreplaceable individual, um, yeah, he's part of the, the stereotype, yeah, he fits in all that, but we'll never see his like again. And we, and, and we believe that. Then my task as the writer is, I've got to make sure I've got him on the page so that it's clear we'll never see his type again. Um, we are each of us in irreplaceable and unrepeatable, no matter how much we fulfill a cliche or a stereotype at even a short distance. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> There's a Jesuit, I'm told it's a Jesuit saying, it's the hard road leads to heaven. And you've just spelled out a very hard road for a novelist. Choose a stereotype, choose to uh, reinvigorate it or invigorate it, and do it by showing the person as utterly typical and yet as utterly uh, individual as, 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 a, as a person, the way in our tradition we understand a person. It's amazing to hear you spell it out that way because uh, it sounds uh, like such a challenge that you set to yourself when you when you first started explaining, but by the end it seems inevitable and necessary that that's what a novelist does. And I'm hearing also what confidence you have in the ability of the novelist to do these things, to make characters real on the page, to make a character who's not like any other, to make a character that we recognize as alive. Maybe it's taken for granted in this room that we can have such a confidence about uh, fiction and language, but uh, it's not um, taken for granted at all, even in the literary world. Uh, it's exceptional, isn't it? Uh, or have you been made to feel how strange it is that you have that confidence? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, th I agree with you. It's not taken for granted at all. And I think um, where many um, fiction writers fail, and I, and I see this in my students, and I see this in, in some contemporary work as well, um, is uh, in, in that they're only they're, they're setting out to prove um, what we've all already accepted and we're all wrong about. <laughs> you know? um, they're, they're siding with the masses in looking at a character rather than standing with the character against um, the, the quick uh, judgment. It's amazing, too. One of the tensions in your work, I think, you so accurately and uh, pitilessly rec represent the church as in all of its, um, uh, in its great ability to uh, have a model and then replicate it all over Brooklyn and Queens <laughs> without any variation. <laughs> and yet that the same tradition that could be so, uh, um, uh, so comprise conformity in so many ways could then uh, uh, instill in, in, in its members such a sense of the individuality of each human being. It's a, it's, it's a paradoxical and the makings of, of the kind of fiction you write, I think, the, that tension. Do you feel that when you're, when you're writing it? Because you, you are pretty uh, honest about the cookie cutter aspects of Catholicism, sure, are you not? Sure, sure, yeah, that's there. Um, but you know, in some ways, I guess I, I relate um, my interest as a, as a fiction writer my interest in family um, sort of uh, mirrors the way I look at the church. Um, uh, I, I think that I have characters who understand how difficult and complex it is to live within a family. So they're not surprised to find out that their church is difficult and complex. Um, and, and, it looks like a lot of other families And looks from the like outside. another families from the outside, right, yeah. exactly. I mean, it's, and, and they wouldn't want it any other way. You know, of course, this is the way to live, and this is, um, you know, that there is the traditional family that they want, and there's the traditional church that they want, but they also understand, um, you know, your brother is a pain in the neck, <laughs> you know, um, and I can't stand my husband today, um, and, um, and we're fighting. We're all living in, in a two-bedroom apartment, but, but three of us aren't speaking to each other, <laughs> you know. Um, that, and, and, and that does not say, um, it doesn't undermine loyalty to the family, and it doesn't undermine their love for one another, but they recognize um, that strife um, is, is part of the equation. So I think that sense then to look at the church uh, failing them 
um, being less than everything it promises to be, um, well, sure. You know, yeah, we're the, there's human. There's a, there's a, a line in the in in the new novel um, that I can't remember exactly how it goes, <laughs> um, but uh, the the mother of um, of Gabe, who spends some time uh, as a priest, uh, right away says to him, you know, there there are just as many lousy people in rectories as there are out on the street. You know, um, <laughs> no, um, no surprise there. Well, you know, they're all human. What, 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 what were you expecting? And he spends 50 years no really figuring out uh, what it was he was expecting. Yes, and, yes, uh, and, yeah. And how the expectations, expectations and the reality didn't quite uh, square, I guess. There's a passage I was telling you about before we walked in uh, from, from the new novel, an image that I think captures your way of working, your way of telling a story. The protagonist, whose name is Marie, is having an interview at the funeral parlor in Brooklyn. She doesn't want to work in Manhattan, so her mother, uh, with great cunning, uh, arranges an interview with the director of the funeral parlor uh, in the neighborhood. And she goes, uh, and his name is Fagan, and oddly enough, he's a lover of Dickens. He thinks he'll reckon, <laughs> re rescue Fagan's bad name. He has a complete set of leather-bound Dickens in the office at the funeral parlor with all the holy books. And he asks Marie whether she's read uh, David Copperfield, and she says no. And uh, he takes the book uh, from the shelf. He was a large, broad man in his suit, and yet his small head made him seem younger than he was. As he turned back to me with the book in his hands, one of the remaining volumes tilted softly into the empty space. It would remain just so my 10 years at Fagan's until I returned the book from him on my last day. Married by then, and expecting my first child, apologizing that I kept losing the thread of the tale. So here's, Al here's memory and time, Alice McDermott fashion. Uh, uh, spoiler alert, she's gonna flash ahead 10 years to the uh, end of the job and the character's marriage in between dashes here and tell you how things are gonna turn out in that literal way. She's also gonna suggest uh, through the character's uh, struggle to read Dickens, that th this story will not be told in the Dickensian fashion, one episode following another. Uh, it will uh, wind around in, in a stranger way. How, so you, ha you have a way of uh, mingling episodes from different uh, decades uh, all through the book, and yet it coheres in a very, uh, it doesn't feel postmodern or uh, structurally self-conscious at all. How did you hit on that technique and and how does it bound up with the, um, the is, it, is it natural to your characters? Is it something you had to bring in uh, from the outside, from Faulkner or Nabokov? Or? Well, I'm, I'm sure I brought lots fr in from the outside. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's also, again, just uh, trying to understand this character um, and, and to give her voice. Um, uh, and since she is more or less looking back over a lifetime, um, it seemed that she would interrupt herself, uh, even um, making sense and, and putting things, putting puzzle pieces together. Um, one thing that happened, and, and yet she's tell what she's describing as happening, she knows what happens 10 years down the road um, at the same time. Um, but, but certainly, um, uh, from uh, reading Virginia Woolf at a very impressionable age, um, uh, reading To the Lighthouse and, and suddenly having permission to mess with time if you want to. Um, you know, l learning by, by reading Faulkner and, um, and reading Nabokov, um, that, that very true thing that Flannery O'Connor said is that you can do whatever you can get away with, but you can't get away with much. <laughs> you know? um, but to have permission to, to, you can do that. You, know, you don't have to just tell a story, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um, uh, that's the permission that I got from, from those greats. Um, let's say if they can do it, I can try my hand at it as well. But again, it has to be authentic to the character. And the minute, um, and I've done this often enough uh, in stuff that no one will ever read. <laughs> you know, the the minute you um, you put 
uh, imitating or even aspiring to be the prose writer that a Nabokov or a Joyce um, or a Virginia Woolf is, once that's your first goal, your character is dead on arrival um, and, and your story is only an imitation of a sound. Um, uh, but when your first goal is to get the character's voice right and to be authentic to the character's experience, and you need to reach for one of those tools, um, then having seen someone else do it, I, you can legitimately borrow um, or try your hand at it. But it can never be the, it can never be the goal or the, um, the, the, the motive alone. Um, again, the, and I'm sure there's, this, is, this is all Irish Catholic upbringing, um, but I see it um, in, in, in student work. I see it in, in, in contemporary work. Um, the minute what you're doing is more about you than the world you're creating or the character you're creating, the life is out of, out of your work. Um, Self-consciousness is deadly. Um, so here I am talking about myself for an hour and a half. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. <laughs> but it's interesting. You're talking about yourselves in terms of service and obligation and what one can and cannot do and the ability to uh, um, put one's self uh, second to the character. And I don't want to, over, uh, to, to overload the conversation with reflections on what it means to be a Catholic writer, but certainly this language of obligation is, is, is our argo, mm -hmm. but it isn't necessarily the argo of other writers or of generations going forward. And I'm, I'm wondering what kind of novels uh, we can expect when uh, the gifted novelist didn't grow up with the expectation that there was a nobility in serving someone, whether it was uh, a drunken uncle or a fictional character right. who's a drunken uncle. Right. Uh, I mean, that, so, I mean I, I'm hearing you describe an aesthetic that is striking, striking notes, which are very much notes of this tradition that we come yes, out of. And true. I yeah. have to wonder, um, I, I, I think the, the struggles that you're describing with your students ha must have something to do with the fact that, that um, the, the obligation of uh, serving reality or serving another character isn't, isn't there in the same way. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I think that's true, although um, in some ways um, it's not all as altruistic and missionary-like as, <laughs> as, as I'm sounding to myself, you know, um, yeah, me and the evangelist, you know, we're, <laughs> that's what we do. Um, <laughs> um, but it's also, I have discovered, and I've seen this in working with young writers for a very long time now, um, it's the only way you get the reward of the hard work of working with language. Um, the, the discovery of what language can reveal to you um, is also part of it. And that doesn't necessarily that you're out to serve the greater good um, with that. Um, there's a wonderful story, and I know um, we've often sort of talked with some puzzlement about how much I love Nabokov. Um, but there's a wonderful story of his um, called The Vain Sisters. Uh, and um, and, it's, and it's, it's famous, I guess, for its last paragraph. Somewhere within the story, the narrator talks about a writer, and it's all about these two sisters die, and it's all about messages from the afterlife and all that. Um, and at some point, the narrator talks about um, this ridiculous writer um, who wrote a story that the last paragraph, the first first letter of each word of the last paragraph turned out to be a message from the dead. Well, of course, Nabokov, in the Vane Sisters, the last paragraph um, of the story, if you take the first letter of each word of the last paragraph, is a message from the dead sisters to the narrator. It's, uh, it's, and you don't, I mean, it's a wonderful story, and if you never sit down and actually uh, figure out the code, it's still a wonderful story. But for me, that's such a metaphor for, um, what language can do, language used well, if you work hard enough at it, and if you, you make sure that's what you're serving and not anything outside of it, reveals things. And it might just be something as wonderful as 
that last paragraph was a message from, and in the story, the, the writer of the story doesn't get it, <laughs> you know, but the reader can. Um, so, so that careful working at words, the, the only real reward and the only real reason I can imagine that any of us keeps writing this so-called literary fiction stuff, because fewer and fewer people are reading it, and, and many more people read it and don't get it, <laughs> you know? and more people want to know why um, they haven't made more movies out of your novels. Um, you know, why we keep going back to that, that slow and methodical um, working at words and thinking of fiction as um, sort of a, an anxious uh, younger brother of poetry. Um, is because there are those moments when, by working at words, the world reveals itself in a way it would not have done if you hadn't been there doing that. And that's a great reward, and it has nothing to do with saving the world or, <laughs> or recording the life of a drunken uncle. Um, it's just a great thrill. It's just marvelous when um, working day after day and hour after an hour and week after week and the language suddenly blossoms and surprises you um, and shows you something wonderful um, about the world you've described. And it's just to hear you say it is such a reminder of, of the claim of, of realism in the broadest sense. Flannery O'Connor said, every writer wants wants at some level to be regarded as a realist and that the different visions of reality that we have from Virginia Woolf, from Nabokov, or Dickens, or Alice McDermott are different uh, species of realism or different ways of saying this is the way the world really is. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, lest I seem to be uh, shoehorning you into a, you know, a religious category, I, I hear you speaking very powerfully about the claim of uh, of the power to represent reality in words as what's, uh, what's got you working there day after day sure, more than sure. anything else. And, and that's not to say, here's the, and what about this guy <laughs> part of it. That's not to say, for, for a believing writer, um, it's a reminder that God reveals himself in unexpected ways. Um, the, the revelation um, in the, de the unexpected detail, the unexpected connection, um, the message that comes through the writing, even if the writer herself isn't aware of it, um, is, is revelatory. Um, and that's also thrilling um, that, um, you know, I guess in some ways, I, I, you know, um, when I see myself uh, called often, you know, a miniaturist um, and writing about ordinary people and ordinary life, you know, which, you know, you also say, okay, no fun here, you know. <laughs> you, know. Um, you, you will be, um, you'll be a better person having read her books, but you're not going to really enjoy it much, you know. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, you know, if God didn't want us to see him in the ordinary, he wouldn't have made so much of it. <laughs> you know? um, um, so language can open that up. And, 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 and again, those things that blossom in a sentence um, that, that are unexpected and that would not, never have existed if the fiction didn't exist. Um, it's not something that you can get at in any other way. Um, you know, the poem that, um, again, Nabokov, that hits your spine, not your head, not your heart, but gives you that chill in the spine, which he says is the true instrument um, for, for reading, um, exists in and of itself. And um, if it weren't there, we probably wouldn't miss it, you know, but we would miss that momentary um, sense and beauty um, that hits us in the spine. Are there questions from the audience? Is this the right time for that? It's just so, I d hardly know what to, uh, I don't want to cap what you just sure. said. It just seems like such a good opening uh, to, to the room. Yes? You've got, you've got responsibilities in many of them and varied, family, your students, and your work and you're devoted to all of them. Um, 
I heard separately uh, John Banville and Colm Tobin talk about how they write. Banville has a room in Dublin he goes to every day, five, uh, nine to five, five days a week. Uh, and that's it. He focuses. Tobin can write in the bathroom, in the kitchen, on the bus, um, uh, uh, in cacophony. Um, how do you how do you focus? How do you work? What's your where do you where do you work? How long do you work at a time? Do you take time off? <laughs> well, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah, I, I think. I guess I, I, I'm probably a little bit of both. Um, uh, I do have to sit myself down. Um, I do have to pretend it's a real job. Um, I guess that's, that's my working class background. Um, if you're not doing it from nine to five, um, nobody's gonna take you seriously. Um, um, and they don't, and they still don't. Um, uh, so so I, I do try to treat it as if it were a real job. When my, when my children were small, um, I hired babysitters so that I would have writing time during the day. Um, uh, I, I'm a slow writer, so I need a lot of time to write a lot of stuff I'm not gonna use. Um, uh, but I also um, am grateful for the fact that I have a life, <laughs> you know. Um, and that I'm not writing all the time. I can't imagine how obnoxious it would be to live in a household with somebody who's um, constantly writing. I sat next to Joyce Carol Oates once uh, um, on stage at Town Hall. It was the favorite poem project, and there were 10 fiction writers who had been invited to read their favorite poem. I think Jamaica Kincaid was on one side of me. And Joyce Carol Oates was on the other side. And we were sort of at the end, so the, the first seven readers were getting up and reading their poems. And we each had uh, the program with us. And the whole time she wrote on the program in this teeny tiny handwriting. And we were facing the audience. And I knew that the whole audience was watching her writing and also watching me going, <laughs> try, trying to see what she was writing. I mean, you know, wonder, she's a wonderful writer and she's terribly prolific, but, but um, I wouldn't want to live with her. <laughs> I was once uh, in conversation, I think, with one of Isaac Asimov's sons, and he, what he said was that uh, there was a certain sadness to his childhood because he knew that whatever he was doing uh, with his father, his father would always rather be writing. <laughs> And the, he wrote 200 books or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, there's a certain misery to it, I imagine. Well, that's also I'm also always grateful for the interruptions too. Um, there, there were many a time when um, when my children were small and I'd have a whole writing day stretching before me, and then at 10 o'clock the school would call and say, you know, Will's got a fever. You got to come down and get him. I said, yes, I don't have to write today. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Yes, John. Thank you very much. I'm really struck by um, your writing as service to your characters and how you kept going back to this sort of expression. Uh, the moment the writing becomes about you, the writer, your characters are dead on arrival. So the origin of these characters, where do they come from? Um, you gave a hint with Charming Billy addressing a stereotype but was that really your mood or your thoughts about a stereotype? What's the origin of your characters? Thank you. Um, you know, um, certainly experience, um, I, I think, would be um, dishonest, you know, to say that life experience has nothing to do with it and, and these characters are made up whole cloth. Um, um, even Harry Potter is a made-up whole cloth. <laughs> um, um, uh, so it's, it's observation, characters, that, people that I've met, um, and, or more that people who I know and have met or have had conversations with that have got me thinking. Um, uh, but then, again, once, uh, once even a character I think I'm taking straight from life um, is placed into a novel, um, life doesn't accommodate the rest of the novel. Um, so they become uh, someone else entirely. Um, in someone, uh, for instance, um, 
in some ways, I was aware of, again, a kind of familiar character, um, uh, you know, a, a, a Catholic church lady um, uh, of the last century. Um, but quickly, she became um, a character unlike anyone I had ever encountered. Uh, she, she had her own voice. And, and the funny thing is, um, speaking of voice, uh, and this is why um, those of us who teach so-called creative writing should always be very humble and, and uh, begging, uh, uh, begging forgiveness from our writers. Because for years and years, I used to tell my uh, writing students that a close third-person narrator and a first-person narrator just aren't that different. So stop suffering over whether you're going to tell your story with a first-person narrator or a close third-person. Just go with it. It's not going to make that much difference. And I would illustrate uh, the instruction by telling them, um, when I was first starting out and living in New York, I used to read unsolicited short fiction for Red Book magazine. Um, this was when Red Book published three short stories a month. Uh, and um, they would get thousands of, of short stories sent to them. And I actually talk about Dickens. I was paid 40 cents a manuscript <laughs> <laughs> to go down to the Red Book offices and fill up two bloomy shopping bags with unsolicited short fiction and then read through them and promise I wouldn't bring back more than five for the editors to look at. Um, and one of the stories I brought back just because I was so funny, I opened up the envelope and written in hand uh, written across the story was also available in third person. <laughs> 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 There's a writer with the courage of her convictions. <laughs> no. But so anyway, uh, long story made long, um, I, I was always assuring my students it doesn't make that much difference. And I was nearly finished with this novel. Um, and I had told it all in a limited third person. And it struck me very late in the game. Something wasn't right about the voice. Something wasn't right. And I realized one of the things that I wanted to get at with this character was this is a character who hasn't had a voice, um, who isn't much noticed um, by the real world or by the world in which she lives, the one that I've created on the page. Um, and by writing about her in third person, even though it was a close third, I was suppressing her voice. I had to tell the story in first person. And I hate first person, and I didn't want to tell it in first person. Um, but it was just, so, so the impulse of the story was to capture a voice that has, would be dismissed. Even I, as the author, had to some degree dismissed her early on. And in the novel, she, she wears glasses and has bad eyesight. So it's really striking. You're reading her first person account of things, which is very, very clear. And then you realize that uh, she's just seen as this myopic girl in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, that, and the, the contrast between the way she sees things and the way she's seen is dramatically apparent in just the way that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yes. I wanted to thank you very much for saying yes to Catherine Wolf in um, the Heroes of Conscience book that just came out. And um, just hearing tonight that you said no to Paul about writing about saints, I'm wondering what your experience was in writing that piece. And thank you to you both for actually saying yes to her. And I'm grateful for the book coming out now. So please comment. Thank you. Um, yes, this is. Um, uh, a collection of, of essays by a number of Catholic writers, um, not less than everything. It's called Edited by uh, Catherine Wolfe. Um, that was just published um, February, I think it was. Um, and Catherine contacted me and asked if, um, it, it started out it was going to be called My Favorite Heretic, um, which I thought was a little sexier than T.S. <laughs> than Eliot, but what do I know? Um, um, and. Uh, and that was sort of a different assignment than, than um, what Paul and I had discussed all those years ago about writing about saints. Um, and, but even in that, I mean, I immediately, when she asked me to do it, I said, I want to write about Horace McKenna. Of course. Um, uh, and, but even in that, I felt um, I don't want to make this a creative essay. 
I don't want to make this about me. Um, I, you know, and, and it's hardly even a personal essay. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, I, I, I wanted to introduce Father McKenna to the a larger world that I thought this this book uh, would have in its readership. Um, and I wanted to get his words on the page. Um, I knew from other reading I had done that um, he had always hoped to, to have his, uh, his sermons uh, published. Um, uh, and, um, and, and those of them that survive, or his interviews that survive, um, are wonderful. And, and so that was very much a case of, um, I'm being asked to write a personal essay about my favorite heretic, um, but I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about Father McKenna. I don't want to step out of the way um, as much as I can. But of course, I had to say how I knew about him and how, um, and it was through Gonzaga um, that, that I got to know of him. So I, I had to put that in. But it was not about my inner life um, or my spiritual life. Um, it was really about his life. And, um, and, and so that was, and in some ways, it was just easy just to um, step back and introduce Father McKenna in many of his own words in the essay. Yes. I was fascinated with your comments about language. Need the microphone. I was fascinated with your comments about language, and I've heard a number of different writers, fiction writers as well as poets, say, what is their moment of genesis for starting the creative act of writing? Um, and uh, one uh, fiction writer I'm thinking of said she always has to start with an image. I remember one uh, a poet saying, no, for me, it's a word or a phrase. And as you were talking, I thought you really are invested in your characters. And the one you just went to here now was voice that became so important to you. As you look back over the novels that you have written, can you now, with hindsight, identify um, you know, a particular genesis? Like, I was really stunned to hear you say the parlor floor and basement, that you cherish that phrase. I'm thinking back to listening to a poet recently talk, and I thought, oh, he would love to be sitting next <laughs> to you right now, because that would be what would have gotten his creative juices flowing. But when you talked about Charming Billy, you thought back to a type of a person, but you wanted the individualization once of that person. It was a character, and once it was a phrase, or is no, it always, both, always an can image? Can you think, in, in terms of each novel that you've written, is there something that you can put your finger on now with hindsight, like your most recent one? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, sometimes it's a character, sometimes it's, it's a phrase, um, sometimes it's, you know, what you sort of vaguely think of as theme, you know. Um, uh, I had a student once down in, um, <laughs> down in Lynchburg, Virginia, who was a 29-year-old, um, <laughs> like, like ninth semester um, <laughs> graduating senior. He was a wonderful character, but his life had themes. Um, so like he would come in late, uh, and and I, you know, and it'd say, "Gee, I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, I like, but one of my themes is I should always get enough sleep." <laughs> 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 so <laughs> he was he was delightful, but his life he had no themes in his writing, but he, his life his life was just full of themes. So every time I hear, I hear myself saying, "Oh my, one of my themes." <laughs> <laughs> I hear Ed, you know, oh yeah, right. Um, but yeah, but sometimes it's a theme as in an idea about things that, that you're ready to explore. Um, my second novel that night um, was something that sort of um, kind of sneaked up on me, I think. Um, uh, I was writing another story, another, what I thought would be my, my second novel that my wonderful editor, Jonathan Glassy, had read and we wrote a contract for, um, uh, and um, and I found the characters in this novel that I thought I knew very well um, were just sort of sitting down in the middle of the scenes and reminiscing about their childhoods, um, and they weren't supposed to do that, and it wasn't getting me anywhere, and um, 
And I paused and I thought, there's something I want to write about the nature of memory, um, which I had not used as a theme before. This was only my second novel. Um, and, and storytelling. And um, so I very consciously sort of put aside the, what I'd been working on and said, I'll write this out. Maybe it'll be a short story. Um, maybe it'll be a short novel. I don't know. And, and then I began with um, a version of a story that I had heard that my contempt, that people I, I grew up with would use to illustrate the kind of neighborhood we grew up in. So it was a, a moment um, where the peace and quiet and safety of this 1950s, 1960s bedroom community on Long Island was disturbed by this event. And people didn't use it to talk about the event. They used it to illustrate what an aberration this event was that nowadays, now because some kids, a teenager stood out on the sidewalk and used a curse word. And that disrupted the neighborhood for hours and hours. You know, um, So it was an illustration of, boy, have things changed. Um, so I was very consciously, OK, I'll start with that. I don't know who these teenagers are going to be. I don't know why they're shouting out on the street. Um, but someone's got to tell a story about that, and I'll write that out so I can get back to my real second novel, which I never returned to. <laughs> and that night became my, my second novel. So it was that story. Um, so there's that. Um, again, theme in my third was, was more the idea of um, what gets what is known between generations and what gets dropped out. Um, and I felt I'd been reading a lot of novels that were multi-generational, and it struck me that every generation knew everything there was to know about the one that had come before it. And again, maybe this is the, my immigrant family that nobody talked about anything, and I didn't know where anybody came from, and um, uh, there wasn't a lot of information getting exchanged. So I was interested in what gets passed on, but what never gets spoken of, and what happens to that. Um, so that was a thematic, and that's, that was where that novel started. So this is what I say. It's, you are a novice every time, because it's a new experience every time. Yes. Um, thank you very much. I mean, what you say about language, thank you very much. What you say about language is wonderful. But doesn't art also come from art? Are there any authors whom you particularly respond to or resist? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I better be careful about the ones I resist. <laughs> so, yeah. um, well, um, you know, there, there are those um, foundational authors. Um, anyone who studied English, as I did at a state university um, in the 1970s, has Faulkner, Fitzgerald, and Hemingway in their DNA. I mean, those were the writers you studied and you loved and you're amazed by. Um, for me, Henry James came in there, too. I was obsessed with Henry James um, in college. Um, uh, I can't get my graduate students to read him these days, um, but, but I was uh, obsessed and enchanted by the language. And again, Virginia Woolf is a writer that I go back to. Virginia Woolf gave me permission as a writer to do things I never would have. <laughs> no, I went to Catholic school. I didn't read Catholic authors. <laughs> and I very reluctantly went to the Irish authors, too, I have to confess. I visited Russia before I ever visited Ireland as a, as a student. Um, but slowly, yeah, I came around to, I have to say, I, I admire Flannery O'Connor tremendously. Um, and, and I love her essays, and I love her letters. I've never loved her fiction. I just don't love it. Um, I admire it tremendously. Um, I always have my students read stories like Revelation of certainly Good Man is Hard to Find, they have to read. Um, 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 but, but she's not the writer who made me a writer. Um, and I remember reading her and thinking, this is a Catholic writer? This? <laughs> you know, this misfit guy blowing people's brains out? This is a Catholic writer? Um, so it took me a while to, to understand what she was up to, but she was not the writer who made me a writer. Um, Nabokov, since I, I keep bringing him up, um, is a writer who made me a writer because, um, not just because of what the wonderful and amazing things he does with language, um, uh, but, but also I, I think um, how well he can, once again, portray a character who we should really hate um, or that we should stand back from and, and slowly and surely uh, prove that he is us. Um, you know, uh, 
Yes, Dave. Okay, David Lodge. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I came to him a little bit later, but yes, exactly. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm so glad you came. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, I have a question. I'm very interested in the tension between motion and stagnation that I perceive in Charming Billy. Um, thinking about the organic process of writing versus the structure, um, I kept thinking of kind of a spiral of hermeneutic almost, for you return to a phrase and then you develop an idea and then you return back to the phrase, um, that rhythm. So I don't know if you had any further comments on that. Well, I like that you say rhythm, because I mean, that's um, as essential to me as, as subject <laughs> and character. Um, uh, and again, in, in Charming Billy specifically, I mean, there is a, it's a collective storytelling. Um, and certainly it has its parallels in, in Catholic ritual. I mean, the, in some ways, the, the wake is a continuation of the ritual um, of the mass, the funeral mass. Um, and so there is a kind of call and response. Um, but, but also th that, that sense of um, giving voice to each version and each character. Um, and in some way, that collectively telling a life, making a life. Um, I, I think the important thing, that maybe the thing that I discovered um, more than something I brought to, to an understanding of that culture or, or that particular gathering um, is that the, the characters who tell Billy's life to one another after he's died also made his life possible. Um, so in some ways, it's a, it's a literal um, proof um, of, of the power of love, um, that love not only redeems us, it, it gives us our lives. Um, and I think maybe when, uh, when all is said and done, um, and, I'm, uh, and I hear myself um, called a Catholic writers, even though the priest at Fordham were, <laughs> were none too pleased with what I had to say. Um, and I know the Sisters of St. Joseph, who taught me in high school, um, roll over in their graves every time they find out that anybody is, is thinking of me as a public Catholic. Um, but, but when it comes right down to it, I think there is a sense in everything that I write um, that, um, that love redeems us. How is that possible? Is that true? Um, uh, but for me, that's the essential, um, the, the essential thing to discover about faith. Um, because if that's true, then everything else is right. Well, um, would you please join me in expressing our appreciation to these two wonderful people?